The following is a recording of a live questions and answers session with Chris McCann that took place on Friday, December 20th, 2019. Good evening and welcome to our Friday night question and answer program. Tonight we're going to open up the room to take your call and each person is invited to share what's ever on your mind by dialing the number um, that I'm not sure if it was played tonight, so I'll, I'll announce the number. It's 701-801-9989, and that number will get you into uh, the phone system, and then you just follow the prompts and you should be able uh, to eventually ask your question. We have people go into a queue in the order that they call, and we can't uh, establish the order or change the order in any way. It's all part of the conference system, and and so it's automatically done. And, and that also guarantees that we cannot screen calls. We're not, uh, you know, if we see somebody up there and we don't want to talk to them, that we'll, we'll try to put them away. No, we don't do anything like that. Everyone's welcome. We want anyone and everyone to call and uh, to share comments and questions about the Bible. If, if it is about the Bible, then we're interested in receiving your phone call. Yeah, Chris. Uh, last Sunday's question and answers were, I just love them. They, I went over them again while I was working. Uh, you're talking about how God's glory is shown out during Judgment Day, and and it shows that his work in the elect uh, will make them endure and actually be conscious and mentally and spiritually aware of their position. Uh, though it's grievous in the sense you see the division. Um, the unelect, in Revelation 9, it says that they want to enter in but can't because in Judgment Day there is no more salvation. Uh, is that part of the division, the, the, the anxiousness, the infighting, the restlessness, the deceiving in the world? You know, it's like everywhere it oozes out in business and personalities and this unsettled this kind of fear that they have is that they kind of they're not conscious in a christian way but uh they 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 want some kind of a peace is that kind of what's going on they they're just not able at all to receive god's glory or grace or blessing and and how blessed we are, huh? That our our Christ. Anyway, I just wanted to ask you that question. Well, yeah, you're you're referring to Revelation nine, and it says in verse six, and in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them, and um. This has to do with Judgment Day. We know that from the context. And we also know that the only way we can possibly understand this this kind of language is to look at it spiritually because men have been seeking death, um, you know, throughout history. The, the wages of sin is death. And, and so when men seek sin, they're seeking death. And, uh, and of course, when uh, there's numbers of people that literally or physically try to kill themselves, if anyone wants to look at it that way, and they don't have a difficulty, it, it's still continuing today. And actually, I think uh, it may be even increasing. So... There, there's no way of understanding it physically or literally that there's some kind of time on the earth when men are, are seeking to physically die and yet not able to accomplish it uh, and death actually flees from them. That 
you see, that's important because not only are they not able uh, in their in their seeking of death, they cannot find death, but death is said to go away from them, flee from them. Now that just can't be on a physical level. And the rest of Revelation 9, as it's telling us about locusts and and the king of destruction, uh, Abaddon, Apollyon, and the 200 million uh, horsemen that uh, that are riding horses that and it says of the horses they had heads of lions and out of their mouths issued fire smoke and brimstone obviously it, it's all parabolic it, it, it's not to be taken literally so that means we cannot look at the idea of men seeking physical death it cannot be that it has to be something spiritual and it has to be um, a type of death in the spiritual realm that that a man cannot find and that actually goes away from him as though it's it's running from him where death does not want the man to find him and and so he flees and that also does not apply to the typical sinner's type of, of spiritual death because, um, again, mankind has no problem or difficulty finding spiritual death. They're born in sins. They're born dead in their soul. And death is not something they cannot find. They, they have it. And death is not something that flees from them no, it stays with them all their life until they die in their physical body. So that doesn't qualify. It cannot be physical death, and it cannot be that understanding of spiritual death where someone is dead in trespasses and sins. So neither of those things fit. Then what does it leave us with? And what it leaves us with is what the answer is found in Romans chapter 6, in Romans 6, where we read in verse 2, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried, and to be buried is language of death. We are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. And, and so uh, in the, these verses, there's reference after reference to death, to being buried with Christ through his baptism into death. And it, it, it really is language that identifies with what happens in salvation. We are dead in, in Christ. We, um, we, we have entered into that baptism of his. And when we take that idea and go back to Revelation 9, we, we read again in verse 6, And in those days shall men seek death. And now if you uh, understand death to be identification with the death of Christ or salvation, then you ask the question, do men seek death? And the answer, that kind of death? And the answer is yes, all the time. All the time. That's, that's what's happening in churches and, and all over the place as people think they're becoming saved or, or are looking to the Bible in this way. 
so it continues from there. In those days shall men seek death and shall not find it. That That is understandable now because it is seeking salvation through identification with the death of Christ and its judgment day, and so it cannot be found. And, and now that understanding fits with everything else, like the sun is darkened and um, the moon's not giving its light, and, and all the various language in the Bible that indicates that the door is shut, that judgment day is a day wherein there is no salvation. And, and, and that's what's in view here. It's the uh, same idea of men coming to the door, once the door is shut, and knocking on the door, crying out, Lord, Lord, open to me. And then he, uh, the Lord uh, answers and, and says, Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. The, the door does not open. They're seeking, they're seeking that salvation or identification with Christ's death, but not able to find. And actually, doesn't it say that in Luke 13, in Luke 13 regarding man's inability, it says in verse 24, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able when once the master of the house has risen up and is shut to the door and ye begin to stand without and to knock at the door and so forth. You see that many in that day when the door is shut will seek to enter in and not be able. That is the idea here. They seek death and shall not find it. They're unable to enter in, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. Now we, we uh, can, can uh, get the picture that it's as though God is going from them, they, that the salvation of Christ is departing from them, where it's no longer in the world, no longer available for the sinner. And then we have uh, an understanding that fits every statement in the verse and the Bible as a whole and the context of Judgment Day. And, and it actually has um, very uh, pertinent application to our present time because this is what's happening in the spiritual realm as as we're going on day by day through the prolonged judgment period. Now, this doesn't have, uh, of itself, doesn't have anything to do with the world's division and, um, you know, the infighting between left and right and this group and that group and, and, and uh, a third group and a fourth group. It, it, no, that's something else. But uh, this would relate only in the sense that the world is turned into hell, and that's what the early verses of Revelation 9 are describing, when smoke comes up out of the pit and darkens the sun, it, it turns the condition of the earth into darkness, which was the condition of the pit. And, and so the statement in Psalm 9 that uh, the nations are turned into hell is fulfilled beginning on May 21, 2011, up until now, and from everything we can read, according to biblical evidence, until 2033. And this is uh, the situation that develops when we, we have these kind of ingredients all together. We have no more salvation, the departure of the Spirit of God from the world in a saving way, but also God is pulling back um, from the activity of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of men so that the law written upon their heart is growing darker. They, they're unable to 
detect or discern basic morality um, having to do with marriage, having to do with personal relationships between men and women. And, and, and so they're losing sight of the basics of humanity, the, the basic understanding of what it is to be a human being created in the image and likeness of God. And, 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 and so when that's going on, and, and then we have the Lord Jesus ruling with a rod of iron, actively ruling as King Abaddon, or Apollyon, that is King of Destruction, to destroy them, and, and, and so the Lord is uh, allowing this bit of information to come to light, to cause public ridicule and shame over here, and that bit of information to come to light, to cause the public institution or the, the media or entertainment industry or, or whatever once world famous and renowned and and highly esteemed organization, now it's a shameful thing in the eyes of the world. So all these things are going on at once that is making the earth a more and more difficult place and to just live on a daily basis. Uh, and I think we all are feeling this and people in the world are feeling this. And, and yet, uh, by God's grace... There's still a, a kind of functionality. There's still an operation. The world is is still going on day after day, and you know we we're able to go to work and go to the store, and and it's able to function in that way. But the fabric of society is falling apart. It, it and indicating that um, Babylon has fallen, that the kingdom of this world has fallen. But thank you for calling and sharing. And now let's go to our next caller tonight. Welcome to our program. Please go ahead with your call. Uh, Chris, can you read uh, Romans 8.28? Romans 8.28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Okay, my question is, uh, back when a person, an individual was in a besetting sin, okay, and it was, you know, he was in that sin, during that time, however long it was, was that considered a waste of time, or was that, uh, considered, you know, things were working together for good? Or was that a waste of time? you understand my question? Yeah, yeah, I do. And, of course, it, this verse only applies to God's elect. Um, we, we, it, it's not true of someone who is not um, one of God's elect who isn't actually saved. But if someone is truly saved, and they are one of God's elect, then when God says, uh, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose, that this literally means all things in the individual's life everything. And so it, it would apply to uh, our past life when we were in the world and, and we were doing, you know, whatever. And of course we were actively involved in sinning or it could apply to when God began to call us. And, and yet uh, maybe we were in an ongoing sin for some time um, before you know, he he uh, shook us loose and chastened us and 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 corrected us. But whatever it is, it means all things work together for good. Now, how could 
someone who is in an ongoing sin of drunkenness or, or drug addiction and did many terrible things and, and you, you know, they lost their family, um, they lost their career, they, they became impoverished and, and just maybe were even out on the street. And, and how could that all together work for good? Well, uh, I don't know. I don't know, but it could be that, that uh, this is the way God determined to bring that person to the point of, of being humbled and broken. And this is, um, you know, the preparation that was necessary before then that person finally um, heard the true gospel and, and God saved them by his word and they, they were then transformed and, and, be, and the Lord began to draw them and they began to live a life that was more pleasing to him. You know, we, we don't know God is God and who, who can understand how he controls circumstances and events of our life I mean, we can only look back on ourselves and, well, let me, let me give an example. I'll, I'll give a personal example. In, in my case, you know, I was a young uh, teenage alcoholic. I, I started drinking at 12, and I drank for about 10 years. And the, the way that I stopped drinking was I went into the military I got into trouble, and the military, the United States government, sent me to a rehabilitation unit, and through that, they directed me to go to AA meetings, and I went to AA meetings, and in the AA meetings, they started letting us know that you have to tell your story. You know, it, it was part of the... Um, the rehab center, the Navy rehab center, and we would go to meetings and you have to start telling your story. And it becomes sort of a, a habit when you go to 12-step meetings. And before you know it, they'll, uh, I would go to a meeting and raise my hand. And see, I had a problem speaking before this. Uh, I, I was very shy in front of audiences and, and you know, you wouldn't even know I was there and, and yet, now this forced me to raise my hand, and I began talking about myself, and you even tell your story where you're the only one talking, and uh, it's for like a half hour. You know, basically, it, it was looking back, preparation for what, what the Lord would have me to do in teaching in front of people, speaking. And actually, after that, after, you know, a few years of sobriety, I started working at a diagnostic rehabilitation center in Philadelphia. And at that time, they uh, had a Tuesday meeting. It was, it was mostly uh, drug-addicted people. That there was a heavy cocaine epidemic uh, in the late 80s. And and yet there was some alcohol, and, and every Tuesday I was assigned where I had to give a lecture for about 45 minutes, and I had to talk about sobriety. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, so there, and there's a room of a couple hundred people, a uh, captive audience, and, and I had to do it every Tuesday. So you can see how one thing leads to another. First, I'm a, personally a drunk where I have a problem. God uses it where I start to come out of my shell and speak in public. Then he uses it further where now uh, I'm actually starting to um, stand in front of people and teach. and And then from there, it just develops more. So when I look back, I understand. I understand why 
I, I was involved in that kind of a sin, or in other words, how God used that in my life, and, and how it relates to the present. But we may not always have understanding of, of what's going on, but one thing we do always know is that God's will is perfect. It's perfect. And he doesn't waste anything, you know, to, to uh, answer your question. He doesn't waste anything. He didn't waste anything in Mordecai's life when, when Mordecai reported those spies, those assassins who wanted to kill the king. Completely forgotten about until the appropriate time. He didn't waste anything in Joseph's life when Joseph was sold as a slave. And, you know, that was bad enough. And then he was um, wrongfully accused of uh, adultery and cast into prison and uh, there for a couple of years. And, and certainly it would appear that things were not working for good. All things were not working for good in his life, but then God used it. He used every bit of it for Joseph's good and for the good of the people of Joseph. And, and that's, what well, we can trust. And, and, you know, this is a wonderful biblical truth. It's a wonderful Bible teaching that, that nothing is wasted. Everything has value and purpose, not a cast down head or, or not a shed tear. Nothing has been wasted by God. He he uses everything, and it's full of meaning for what he intends to accomplish in the life of his people. Um, I, I mentioned this before a while ago, but I remember a couple, maybe two, three decades ago or further, where I came across the book, I think it was, it was called Logotherapy or, or something like that. It was written by Viktor Frankl. And Viktor Frankl was a Jew who um, went through the concentration camps. And his big concern, his main focus after coming out of the concentration camps was this idea of meaning therapy, uh, logos coming from the Greek, and he understood it in the sense that where logos is the word for word, but he understood it as meaning uh, therapy or purpose therapy. It, it was his observation that the, the men and women in the concentration camps that lacked purpose, they they were experiencing this this just awful, terrible tragedy, and yet they had the, they had no uh, grounding, no strength coming from a sense of purpose. And it was his observation they tended to die sometimes quickly, and and did not make it. But others, he he would talk to and and notice and observe, they, they were tougher, they were stronger, and they endured through the concentration camp, and he came to the conclusion that it had to do with a sense of purpose. Now, he wasn't a Christian, but I, I think his observation is correct, because everybody in the world suffers. Everyone will suffer. And and I, I think that's obvious. We're all going to feel pain and 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 suffering to some degree. And yet, for the elect child of God, more than anybody else, we can have a sense of purpose, a sense of deep meaning as we go through the suffering. And that's what the Bible tells us that. 
uh, were reproached for the name of Christ, for the sake of his word. You know, it, it's not just for no reason, but everything we go through thereby is redeemed. It, it is it becomes something of value and worth and and that's what this verse in Romans 8:28 is telling us all things work together for good every single thing and you can't get any more purposeful than that and the things that that the elect child of God are working towards are eternal things things of God things of his word things that will go on for eternity and vain things are temporal things things that pass away and and that's why um, God's people do have purpose and God's people will endure through this long long judgment period uh, just as we came through the great tribulation we will endure till this time period completes and it will be God doing it within us and it will also be because we have a deep sense of purpose to to finish uh, the thing that God has given us to do the task or he'll finish the work in us but we also have a work to complete but thank you for calling and sharing and now we'll go to the next person on the phone tonight. Welcome to our Friday Night Question and Answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Would you please look at Luke 22:42? Luke 22:42 says, uh, saying, "Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine." Be done. When Mr. Camping did a study on Samson, he said that Samson had a death wish because he allowed basically Delilah to discover his vulnerability, which actually led to his um, ultimate mission and his death. And so Camp, Mr. Camping also said that he was a pic- Samson is a picture of Jesus and Jesus also had a death wish. So that if we think he had a death wish that he wanted to, uh, with joy, Jesus wanted to fulfill his mission of redeeming the elect. So I'm just wondering if when he asked the Father to remove the cup from him, did he was he thinking that he wanted to uh, the father to not have him die in the the activities of Gethsemane and the occurrences in the episode before the cross that he might fulfill his mission that he wanted that cup to pass from him or do we think that he wanted in his humanity to avoid the whole torment of the cross well uh, I think we have to first be careful with the language of death wish Um, now I understand what mr. camping saying because we see that kind of statement in the book of Jonah in Jonah chapter 4 in Jonah 4 and Jonah is a type of Christ and we read in verse 3 of Jonah 4, Therefore now, O Jehovah, take, I beseech thee, my life for me, for it is better for me to die than to live. So, uh, you know, of course, the theologians just just add this to the idea of Jonah, such a rebellious prophet, he'd rather die than see the people of Nineveh be spared but no this is a type of Christ and it is a fact that everything here applies to Jesus it's as though the Lord Jesus is saying I beseech thee take I beseech thee my life from me 
for it is better for me to die than to live. And it's better for those that he died for that he die than live. So this does express a desire to die, but it, it's a desire to die in obedience to the will of God so that the people that God has chosen might live and might become saved. Now, as far as um, the petition of the Lord Jesus while in the garden to the Father, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as, nevertheless, not as I will, but as Thou wilt. We have to understand this is something different. This is something different because the Lord has already had the sins of his people laid upon him and he's already paid the penalty of death for all those sins at the foundation of the world. And so that was a, a terrible experience and and he experienced it uh, to the utmost and he paid the penalty in full and then rose from the dead declared to be the son of God first born from the dead the resurrected Lord but now as the son of God as as the one who has already paid for sin he enters into the world according to the will of the father to carry out the demonstration of what he had done earlier and in God's plan for this demonstration he will actually suffer the wrath of God a second time and this is why Moses smote the rock twice and Moses the law and the word smite is to kill he killed the rock who is Christ twice and now it's time for Christ to die a second time and, and yet we learn um, from some of the language in the Bible that that uh, he learned obedience uh, by the things that he suffered that he was moved to strong crying and we, we can see the grievous nature of the wrath of God upon him as he's already begun to experience the wrath of God when he's in the garden this is Thursday evening and the three days and three nights have begun so it's not a matter of getting cold feet or being fearful of going to the cross because what's what's going to happen on the cross that agony is already in agony we read he's in an agony while in the garden and 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 so what it is is now he is knowing and and the reference of, of of that day and hour which is a synonym for judgment knoweth no man neither the son could that statement that verse could be said prior to the garden of gethsemane because uh, the Lord Jesus did not know the wrath of God in a demonstration before. He only knew it while bearing sin, and, and therefore this was something he did not know and now was knowing, was experiencing it, and it was terrible. And yet, just just imagine for a second, you're, you're being struck dead, by the Father, by the law of God, and you're in an actual agony, and and you are suffering grievously, and yet you cannot even say to yourself, yes, but but at least I'm paying for the sins of these that I love, and and I am uh, I am. Uh, ridding them of their sins and freeing them and delivering them and I am cleansing them you, you see all the wonderful things Christ could have um, had comfort with at the foundation of the world 
because he was doing all that then, none of it applied in 33 AD. He, oh, the only thing he could say was that I am obeying the Father. I'm doing the will of the Father. And we're showing forth what I have done. And this is necessary. It must be done. And and you see, it, it, it doesn't have the same depth. It, it, it doesn't have uh, all, all the tremendous comfort that that actually paying for the sins and and if you don't pay for them these people will perish so it it had to be and certainly uh that encouraged him and there was none of that encouragement at this time in 33 AD and and so his soul was exceeding sorrowful unto death we read in verse 38 and and so he goes to the father Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Never list, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Basically, we can understand that Jesus is praying, Lord, is this absolutely necessary that I go through the entire demonstration that, that uh, I've demonstrated up to this point? Is it really necessary to continue this after all? None will be saved, and and yet he he reverts back to the perfect will of God. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And three times indicating the purpose of God is that his will be done, and Christ's purpose is to fulfill the will. And it, it just gives us a glimpse into uh, the the tremendous... Um, character, the, the tremendous being that the Lord Jesus Christ is as God in the flesh. And, and it also helps us, you know, here we are in a time of demonstration. And uh, it, it, in a similar way, before uh, there used to be affliction and persecution for the word's sake, and, and people would, would sacrifice their lives in many ways as the Lord led them to do so and yet the people of God could always say but I must go to that foreign land and I must um, carry the gospel because if I do not then these people will not hear and be saved and if I don't give of my life then how can others be saved it, it was always a concern for giving up our life and being a living sacrifice that others might experience the like blessing of salvation as we, and yet here we are, ourselves in a demonstration, in appearance before the judgment seat where God commands, go out and feed my sheep and, and publish to the nations and tell them, the, the things that you've learned about Judgment Day and, and so forth. And, and, and yet there have been people and uh, they, they've verbally expressed this. And I, I'm sure it's been on the minds of many. But Lord, you know, uh, you, you're calling me to do the same thing, to take up my cross, to experience affliction, and tribulation and persecution for the word's sake. And, you know, if I don't actually go, if if I just, um, you know, live my life here much more comfortable in my own town and, and not actually go overseas or, or um, you know, uh, risk public ridicule again, then what's it going to hurt? It's not really going to change anything. It, it, people are saved anyway. And you see how Christ's experience of obedience, even unto death, the death of the cross, or when he learned uh, obedience as a son, that it is also instruction for us. It, it, is, um, it is showing us that there needs to be obedience in the demonstration and that it has purpose 
it has value and meaning, as we were talking about before, because it is the will of God. And ultimately, maybe that's the thing for us to learn, that it's, it's not um, do the will of God because it produces um, a dramatic result or, or something exciting as, uh, as far as the salvation of others, but simply that the, it's always been this way. It, our, our, our task, our, our, our purpose in life is to do the will of God no matter what, no matter the circumstances, no matter uh, the reasons behind it, God commands us, that's what we're to do. That's what I think we've been learning, and more and more people have begun to start reaching out, start handing out tracts again and going on track trips or doing various things in, once again, offering up their lives as a living sacrifice, and it, yet it's all within this tableau, within this demonstration, and yet it's pleasing to God. Well, thank you for calling and sharing. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think we have time for another caller tonight. We are almost at the hour, so we'll just end our program at this point. I would like to thank everyone for joining with us tonight and asking your question or making your comment and especially for sharing the Bible verses that you did that gave us all an opportunity to read and consider what God has said in these verses, and that's always a blessing. You're all invited to join us again this coming Sunday afternoon at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. But for now, have a good night, and may the Lord's perfect will be done. You've been listening to eBible Fellowship's Questions and Answers Time with your host and Bible teacher, Chris McCann. You can hear these question and answer sessions Sunday afternoons following the Sunday studies and certain weeknights. Check eBibleFellowship.org for the latest schedule. Until next time, may the Lord's perfect will be done.